she's going to give a nice talk that she recognises sort of national weight. <clears throat> I tell you what, I'm losing my voice again. Mary, okay, you could be done a lot of talks around the world. I can see you've done about eight of them so far. <laughs> UK's already been number one for you. Anyway, I'm going to hand it over to you because I still keep getting these frogs in my throat, okay? So over to you, Thank you. <laughs> over to you Mary. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, a good afternoon, really, isn't it? But I'll take you into the evening. It's been an absolute pleasure to be invited here by Miles. I've known Miles a number of years, and I think it's extremely courageous of him to set something up like this and provide everyone with such a beautiful range of speakers and information. And this is what has to happen. You know it's about spreading the word, about the reality that all of us know a part of what we believe is what everyone needs to be aware of now. I'm going to start off with, um, if you like, what I call the baseline. And I'm going to lead you, hopefully not uh, fairly kindly, down my rabbit hole. And hopefully some of you will find it interesting and also find for yourself that it may make some sense. Um, and I'm hoping that will be the case. So it is a big rabbit hole. And, and what I want you to be aware of is that for me, as I've gone from being a therapist and counsellor of someone which I, you know, I believed all ET interaction was initially very traumatic, I discovered that actually it was only a small percentage of people that were traumatised. There are many people, and many people in this audience, I believe, that have actually had a completely different experience with their um, extraterrestrial encounters. And many of them have been very loving, very warm, and also it's like family. And I'm going to talk a bit about that as well, and particularly the children, because for me, the children are coming in. Um, they've not read the books about this. They haven't watched talk shows. They're coming in with an integrity that I believe, and a purity of information, which I think we really do have to start listening to. But I'm also going to show how, thankfully, with technology, we are able to see far more of our unseen world. So let's see if I can paint the picture for you, and I hope that you enjoy that picture. And really what I believe is happening on this planet now, and what I'm seeing globally with people contacting me from all walks of life, you know, it's from housewives and farmers to scientists, lawyers, doctors, nurses, a whole range of different professions, and many of them clinical psychologists that know that this isn't the third dimensional reality is not what our reality really consists of, that we're all actually experiencing things outside the box. And I'm going to look at outside the box now because I know the reason you're all here is because you've experienced perhaps something outside the box, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So having said that, I'm hoping that my, I can move these slides. Let's try that one, it's not moving. Let's see if we can... Ah, there we go. Ah, and we've gone back one. Let's go back one. So, awakening to our cosmic heritage, and I believe that is exactly what's happening right now. We are in a shift, a shift from one reality to another, from a third dimensional reality to a multi dimensional reality. And after all, you know, what I think we really have to honor now is that this is not a new thing. Um, extraterrestrial interactions are something that have been happening all through our history. And I want to um, discuss that a little bit more in the sense that I believe we're all hybrids, basically, of uh, perhaps a mix of various um, so-called gods with the little g rather than the ones with the big one. This particular um, skull that you're seeing there I think is very fascinating because many times archaeologists have said they found these skulls and it was all due to, to binding of the skull when in fact they found ultimately fetuses with the same shaped skull. So again, we're not told the truth, you know that, and it's time really to start breaking that and opening it up. One of the most wonderful gentlemen I've met in England who lives in the Lake District is Mike Oram. Some of you may know him. I met Mike many years ago, and he wrote the book, Does It Rain in Other Dimensions? 
And one of the most fascinating things he told me is what echoes what's happening with the children now. And he said this to his mother at four years old, and Mike's now、um, around about my age; he's in his sixties. And listen to what he's saying here: something of great importance is going to happen on this earth. It will not happen in your lifetime, but in mine. It will affect all units of consciousness, whether they are mineral, vegetable, animal, or man. It is to do with global consciousness. A vast change in consciousness. The energy is headed this way, and the essence of this energy is light. And the energy will repair our DNA. It will make us complete and who we really are. This is what I was trying to tell my mother at four years old. Now that's pretty profound. And remember, now he's in his sixties. But let's start at the beginning from science. We all know that science has struggled, for whatever reason. To actually honour the fact that this is real, but I have a beautiful gentleman I'm going to introduce to you, Dr. Rudy Shield of Harvard University. I've met I met Rudy about in 2010. Spent four wonderful days with him, and what was fascinating to me his openness to all of this. And he actually did a statement for me, which was supposed to go on a documentary I was in. My mum talks to aliens, and I won't go there right now, but it was supposed to go on to that documentary. And this is what he says about the reality. The statement for Mary's research about the nature of the universe and what the UFO phenomenon is now contributing to our overall knowledge of the structure of the universe. We now understand that the speed of thought far exceeds the speed of light, and we live in a quantum universe, in which the quantum effect resides in the dark energy field. The quantum universe supports information transfer from mind to mind through the exchange of quantum holograms, and proceeding at the speed of thought allows what society calls miracles, such as telepathy, past life experiences, remote viewing, crop circles—all the things that science hates to deal with. UFOs, in particular, get here much faster than the speed of light, and allow their alien visitors to interact with us in a variety of ways. And it's been confusing because the craft can be so different and the beings can be so different. It simply suggests there are a great many civilizations out there interacting with us. My colleagues are not really surprised because we understand that basically all stars in our galaxy host a family of planets, much like our own solar system. And what article of religious faith would it take to say life emerged on only our planet? When there are billions available, and I think that really says it all. So I'm not going to even go into is this real or not. I think we all know that's so. Every six minutes, someone around the world actually sees a UFO, and it's probably even more than that. But why are they here? We all want to know that, and we know it's not just about lights in the sky. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But I am going to show you a wonderful bit of footage that was shown on that documentary, taken by Megan Hazelwood. She's a,、um, a nurse in Sydney. And she took this when she was staying at a bed and breakfast, and I actually visited that very place this time while I was in, in, in England. And what you're going to see is a little bit of the lights that she filmed. And to the left of these is actually Silbury Hill. And of course, you've heard John's wonderful talk this morning. But let me play this for you. Well, let me see what that is. Wait, wait, wait. Karen, oh look, another one come down.、Oh. It's up there, scored up there. No pressure, nothing. Hang on, darling. Oh my God. That's been going on for ages. Oh, hang on, darling. Do you know where that is? Were you to them people yesterday? No, it's not that far. No. I think it's a bit. It could. Where was that? That was mine. It could be. I mean, there was a party on. It could be fireworks. It doesn't look like a dog, does it? No, they're coming from the sky. Yeah. Where is that area? That's where the fireworks are. That's on the left, on the way to the visors. Yes, it is. It's Bishop's Cairns. Well, it's all that way. Oh, <gasps> there's another. Oh my God, that's not fireworks, mate. No, I don't think it is either. Yeah, because look, they're staying up. To, they're staying lit too long, John.
This has been going on for some time now. Yeah, but God, that wood, wood bro, there's a load of them all together, isn't it? Cut circles, there's a lot of them all together. Going to about five or six, or the same field, isn't it? Could be over that way. No, that's why I run this too. I'm introducing you to John and Denise who run a bed and breakfast at Avery, just opposite Silbury Hill. Last night on Tuesday the 17th of July, I arrived here to spend the night and um, upon entering my bedroom, I was looking out the, win the bedroom window which overlooks the beautiful Silbury Hill and I saw the most amazing anomalous lights on the horizon towards the direction of Bishop's Cannings. Um, and John and Denise um, are going to um, explain what they saw as well. They came out to the garden as well to have a look. Yeah, it was like flashes, it? Yeah, like five. One, then another, then another, then another. Then we stopped and then we started again. It went on for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes after that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, she, she filmed one lot and then she changed the film and carried on, it's still going. She got, um, it was for the finish, didn't it? Yes, it would have gone on for about um, 30 minutes to 45 minutes altogether. Yeah. 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 Very interesting to see it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it happened. Well, it was, I don't know. <laughs> and you've never seen anything like it before? And it's quite amazing how there were cars driving up and down this street at that time of night. Yeah. And, and there were these amazing lights. Thank you very much for, for your time. OK, this is um, the scene in daylight. Silbury Hill. And the lights were seen... The lights were seen right over there where that tree is on the horizon. Just to the right of that tree and behind that tree, that clump of trees on the horizon. Now there's been lots of um, controversy about what they were and whether there was something to do with the military and what have you. But remember the two locals that were describing what they'd seen had said that they'd never seen anything like that before. And uh, Megan's actually got many other photographs from other parts of the world, and this one's from Colombia, um, where, it's, as you can see, it looks absolutely identical. And she's got several from other parts of the world. So make of that what you will. But what, it happened, what happened for Megan was this. This is what she said about seeing the UFO, and many of you who have seen UFOs know exactly what she's saying. After I saw the light craft, it changed my life. I felt very emotional for this loving demonstration we're not alone. It was very personal and has profoundly affected my life. I have felt compelled to be of service. This experience has given me so much hope and insights with a real sense of understanding of many things. So for her, it was very, very profound. So let's look at the different triggers that may wake people up from UFO sightings, encounters, orbs, crop circles, communication with interdimensional, extra-dimensional, transcendental, and perhaps even time travelers, solar and planetary frequencies altering human DNA, downloads of data, holographic scripts and symbols, known as star languages, telepathy and healing. So this all seems to be awakening to, for some people, to aware of their uh, dual consciousness, feeling part human, even part connected to their, what they call their um, planetary family or their galactic family. And also a, a feeling that we are changing as a species, some call Homo noeticus. And one young lady says that the children born from 2000 are Homo noeticus, and we are actually going to have even another upgrade she calls Homo novus. So let's see what the evidence is and, and look at what the experiences themselves say and see if we can qualify that in another way. Tracy Taylor, many of you have heard me mention many times, she's a beautiful young woman now, woman, a, mum, a mother now. This is interesting. 
One night I had this intense feeling, she said, before sleep. I wrote in a process where I had little control, something beyond my present understanding. It was contrary to everything I'd ever been taught, and it said that the human race had been created by extraterrestrials. It contained information about genetic manipulation of human and ET DNA to create another species. So what is the evidence of that? Well, we do know we've been visited by gods, the little g, all through our history. Quetzalcoatl is one of them, the feathered serpent in Mexico and South America. And we have evidence that, and people are still seeing the lizard or reptilian beings, and you heard Simon mention his understanding of that, and I'm going to go into that in more detail. But the evidence is there in archaeology, and we know that evidence of other types of beings have been um, visiting this planet all the way through. In Egypt, of course, you know, one looks at that very interesting headdress that, the, um, that is supposed to hear. And what's quite interesting, this actually, um, this particular image was one I took at Mexico um, Museum. Again, that strange shaped skull. And look at what this gentleman here, um, his beautiful gentleman from Ireland, drawn um, the same type of uh, shaped head of the star beings that he has seen. But let's go to what the children say. You're going to see on the left um, of your screen here a young woman's drawing of a blue being. She's nine years old and she calls her Moko. And she's someone who actually helps her understand her non-physical reality. And then, of course, we've got the Indian god Krishna. Note the blue skin. And note another image there that looks suspiciously like a, um, a UFO. It's all there in front of you if you're ready to see it. But let's see what the aborigines um, draw as well, because obviously that's where I hail from these days in, in uh, Australia. This beautiful drawing, artist Teddy Chessels, I think says it all, because there we've got the craft. They know about all the different beings. They know um, the, about the one Gina and others. And here you've got um, someone being taken up into the craft and one of the elders speaking to the greys. And what's also fascinating, this follows through in other countries as well. Many, many people see the mantid being a different colors sometimes. This one was drawn by Kasara, a beautiful lady in America, who drew it for a, a friend of mine who's a scientist, who saw this being standing in front of him for a number of minutes. And he said the, the, the strings of light were going under the skin. It was the most amazing thing to see. And what I found out, that in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, the Hosa called the mantid being the one who teaches and pointed up to the sky. In the Bushman legends, the mantis was the god who came down from the heavens to share knowledge with mankind. And I've heard from others of the ancientness and the, and the wisdom and master geneticist, which is interesting because he was interacting with a, um, a geneticist. And of course, the Aborigine in Australia see them as gods as well and call them the Mamu. And this is what I find really fascinating, is where the links, you see the links all the time. Here's another beautiful picture that I love. Um, I've got a copy of it in my home. And this was given to me by an experiencer in Alice Springs who, um, who was very close to the Aborigines, although he was a white Australian. And he was given this because he talked about his experiences and she wanted him to have it, this Aboriginal artist. And what I love about it is, is not only the wonderful picture that it is, but she's saying this about how she understands these beings. The planets are a half day's journey. They are very friendly and just watch the Aboriginal way of life. They have no guns, spears or weapons. The air on their planet is food and the green uniforms protect from Earth diseases. These space people speak all languages. And the elders say the space people showed them how to grow food, find water, and showed them amethyst stones for healing. Which was, coincidentally, I had this drawing here. You will see in front of you. That particular drawing was done by Tracy Taylor, and she saw that image in a dream. Now, the fascinating thing was she said she saw this being holding an amethyst crystal, although she, did, she wasn't quite sure why. But, of course, that's the aboriginal one, Gina. The similarities are quite um, amazing, as you can see here. The ghost messenger from the constellation of Delphinus, who is represented by owls. 
This particular drawing was done by a lady experienced in Western Australia, saying one minute she saw an owl outside the window and then it morphed into a grey. We know about the screen memories. Most of you will know about the screen memories, whether it's Santa Claus, owls, walls, um, all sorts of different um, familiar type, types of images, which ultimately we, we suspect are the greys. But what's interesting is that they see the, the lights and the orbs as spirits of the ancestors. Now, we, we know that orbs are seen on many cameras now. If it's an expensive camera, you probably won't get so many because it, it actually filters out a lot of the orbs. So the cheaper the camera, the better, which is interesting. These are two I've taken just outside from my front uh, door. Um, and I found, actually, they do... Um, I can actually ask for different colours sometimes and they'll present themselves. But what's interesting, again, would the Aborigine call these the Min Min Lights and Spirits? It's quite possible they do. Now I want to show you another very interesting little connection here um, in the sense of many of the, the fire circles that the Aborigines talk about from the past ancients setting fire to grasslands to find the markings for their ceremonies. They were connected to the space aliens, as they called them. And these were some of the markings. And this one I want you to notice particularly, especially those that are uh, interested in crop circles because you're going to see some of the links again. Some of you will be aware that on the front of the cover of Contact, Dr. Stephen Greer's book, you've got this wonderful image here. And, you know, obviously uh, they meditated on this particular geometric symbol and what they found out was a, a few days later, or it might have been a week, there in the crop circle was the same image. So we are participating, I really believe. But the interesting story is this. This is a happened after a fire circle in northern Queensland. And the lady said there were constant UFO sightings in this particular valley. She'd had experiences. And she was told two days before by an Aboriginal elder that was something very special and sacred about a part of her land, and her, uh, the paddock on her land. Two days later, she and her son saw this strange whirling fire. And they were obviously very panicky, because in, in Australia you are. But what's interesting about this, as you can see, is this fire behaved really strangely. It literally not only formed a stra this strange symbol, but it burned in these strange lines. And he warned her that something very sacred and special was happening on her land, what the, what the Aborigines were saying about the fire circles. Part of the um, happenings there was a lot more to this story, but in the morning, one of her friends took a picture in the field very close to it, and she took what she thought was an angel but very, very interesting. That was the craft the lady had often seen, and you can see here, the night later was a craft. So many ways we're being triggered, is, is my point to this, in lots of different, um, different instances. Contact can be balls of light. It can be extraterrestrial, interdimensional intelligences, I believe. So let's go into that a little bit more. This is what Tracy says. My contact with non-humans, cosmic beings, occurred before I was born. These beings were my family before I came to the Earth domain, and this close relationship has continued after my birth. And a number of experiences I have now found have memories of pre-birth. What they're saying is they were observing their family and knowing that the, the woman that's pregnant is going to be their mother, and actually told their parents afterwards what they were observing after they were born. That is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So the awareness is a lot more than we would, we would be aware now in our human form. Orbs are a modern day phenomena. All of those have been, these ones have been taken by me in different places. This was actually on the extraterrestrial highway on the, coming back actually from Area 51, but that's all another story. I found that quite interesting. That says the extraterrestrial highway. I went to Iseti, um, James Gilliland, for any of you that are not aware. He um, has a wonderful ranch um, in Washington State, and there is Mount Adams here. He has conferences, and in front of you, you're seeing the field of dreams. Um, James is the most wonderful gentleman. He's had interactions with many different um, extraterrestrial and interdimensional beings, including the Sasquatch, um, a whole range of things. And he's so matter-of-fact about it, it is, it, is, it is actually brilliant. But one of the things I wanted to show you again with the orbs on the field of dreams, we were all there, and the first photograph I took with my camera was that this one here, within less, in less than a minute, literally with the next click of the camera, 
Oh, sorry, I've gone too fast. With the click of the camera, it was absolutely filled with all these orbs. And he believes some of them are elementals as well. And I've got no reason to not think that as well. But there are lots of things with the orbs that fascinate me because it's showing us more of a non-physical reality. And many people who are intuitive can see the orbs. I mean, I've got people saying, Mary, I can see an orb flying around you now or there's one just above your head or whatever. So they're there and we know they're there. It's just a matter of showing us more of what we need to see. This is um, on the move in, just outside my home in Agnes Water just again to show you how, how interesting that can be. And this one particularly demonstrates that when this was a meditation in Tepes Lan where Carlos Diaz took the light ships and I was there with um, some of my friends from Australia and we'd just done a meditation and of course these orbs came in. But this one I actually called in, I said to the gentleman who was with me, a friend, get the camera, I'm going to see if I can call one in. I didn't see it. I kept saying, come on guys, show yourselves. And when I felt it was there, I said, click the camera. And as you can see, it's a meter away from my hand. Try it yourself. It's lots of fun. Um, another way, uh, this was interesting because Janet Ozabar, the crop circle researcher, you probably, many of you know from the Netherlands, was we're doing crop circle and contact tour. And this was Bunbury in Western Australia. And I was giving a talk, as you can see here, and there's Tracy Taylor on the screen. But what she took was this image just over my laptop, which you can see in the eyes and the face. It is, um, I think, one of our friends, one of our little visitors. So they're everywhere. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean really anything. So is the human DNA programmer extraterrestrial? The gods with a little g of mythology and religion, are they responsible for DNA upgrades? The Bible, the Christian Bible says, and then God said, and now we take human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. But who is us? So let's take this one step further. Many of you are aware that Francis Crick, who was co-founder of the DNA molecule, author of Life Itself, said this, that an advanced civilization transported the seeds of life in a spaceship. And of course, we have the biological mystery, 223 genes, which are a sideways insertion of genetic material, all related to higher psychological functioning. They cannot explain them. They did not come up with the invertebrate phase of our evolution. And I was told by someone who worked with Crick that no other species on this planet actually has these genes. So that's interesting, but it's only the start. Um, Lloyd Pye, uh, some of you will be aware, sadly he passed away um, recently, but did wonderful work with the star child skull. And that in itself is an anomaly that um, you're, it's well worth you exploring if you're interested in um, the evidence that we're being visited. But in the interve intervention theory, I asked Lloyd if I could just capture that snippet from a whistleblower who was a geneticist, because I, it, you know, the geneticists know about this. And this geneticist says this, by certain methods of DNA dating, one can tell that numerous genes have been recently added to the human genome. If workers in my field were to say such things openly, we would be ostracized and forced to live in a tent. Any work along these lines would be rejected without any form of appeal. So what can we do? So here again, you can't talk about it, can you? But let's take it one step further. What is it about the genetics? And why is a 13-year-old who's had experiences actually saying this? This is the being he drew after an experience with his brother being taken up onto a spacecraft and talking about his brother having to get his teddy to go with him and they didn't have much time. But what he said was, with this drawing, this was not a weapon, but more something to put them, to, um, if you like, hypnotize them or put them into trance. Many um, people mentioned the being stand, having this object, um, which they felt touched their forehead and would put them into a trance state. But he said this, he felt these, these beings were like scientists who were curious about us. And he told that it was something to do with genetics. Now, generally, 13-year-olds don't speak like that. But let's take it one step further. Is human DNA an extraterrestrial code, a message conveying our true origins? This was published in Icarus in 2013 by two scientists in the Republic of Kakistan. The genetic code suggests it was invented outside the solar system several billion years ago. It appears there's an intelligent signal embedded in our genetic code, a mathematical and semantic message, a biological seti, 
This method would have had greater longevity and a chance of detecting ET than a transient extraterrestrial radio transmission. There are recognizable hallmarks of artificiality, patterns essentially irreducible to any natural origin. Very interesting statement, isn't it? Dr. William Brown, um, a molecular biologist in Hawaii University, goes a little bit further, and I'll explain that more in a minute. He said there's historical evidence of genetic manipulation which points to extraterrestrial intervention, i.e. the missing link. In DNA molecules fused together, this does not happen naturally. Many signs of genetic manipulation showing advanced technology will have been used to remodel the genomes in the human DNA. And then we get Dr. Roger Lear. Many of you will be familiar with him. He wrote the book, The Aliens and the Scalpel. And Roger was um, a pioneer because not only did he see implants um, on, on x-rays, but actually removed many of them. I think something like 15 or 16 to date before, sadly, he passed away. And what was interesting with my interaction with, with Dr. Lear was this, um, because he believed, as I do, that there is something happening with our children. And he gave me some wonderful statistics that I haven't got on here, but I have on my other presentations, which show certain, in 40 years, he had looked at the developmental stages in children, and he noticed certain developmental stages had incrementally, impre incrementally increased as much as 60 to 80 percent, like the age of walking, talking, etc. And so he came to the conclusion that not only are star children amongst us, but the entire human race is being advanced forward at a rate that is unlikely to be due to slow evolutionary forces. It's far more likely that the rapid advancement of the human species is due to alien intervention in our bodies and minds. And so that's quite an interesting statement to make. So let's look at what Tracy's saying about these new children, because I want to show you maybe some validation or corroboration she says this, every year these new babies are born and can override dominant conditioning and programming that occurs from birth. Superior mental and analytical uh, uh, abilities and can bypass inferior unsubstantiated clutter to link directly to the subconscious and superconscious. Conscious awareness of their connection to the universe balanced by spiritual understanding. They have enhanced DNA bodily functions, learning skills, abilities are more advanced. Initially, they do not see things as solid. They have to learn what solid is. Extreme sensitivity to thought, emotion, and physical environment, energy frequencies, and parents' awareness. Photographic memories, fast motor neuron responses, telepathy, manipulation of time and space, nonverbal communication are all conscious abilities with these children. Enhanced DNA, as I say, has 10 times the amount of in information and their molecular structure allows the cells to vibrate faster. Everything is accelerated. Now, the evidence of these changes, one of the things that I came across, as I seem to do synchronously, was that medical researchers at the University of California in Los Angeles found that young children exhibit a unique patterning. And they found that, that some, in some children, there are 24 active codons switched on when it, normally there's only 20. And they said these children with 24 active codons have shown remarkable resistance to disease with heightened immune systems and tested for diseases appear to be immune to everything. 1% they believe of children seem to have these extra, extra active codons. Now that is independent of what Tracy was saying. So are they around and can we see them? Are there evidence of them? Here we go. Extra high-functioning high psychic children in China. Seen globally, able to open the flower, um, a flower bud with the power of thought, move beans from a sealed bottle with thought, teleportation abilities, objects and people, have the ability to remotely cause changes in the human body of another, such as raise blood pressure, hundreds of miles from the person targeted. Film changing DNA in a Petri dish. Really interesting. This was in um, a book by Thomas Raffel and Paul Dong, China's Super Psychics. And we have this really interesting little anecdote, a Chinese boy you can see in the dark. And this, this young boy, um, Nong, was two, two weeks after Nong was born, his eyes seemed to be very different. He had blue eyes, which emit a blue-green light, just like cat's eyes. They glow and help him see in the dark. He was able to complete a written questionnaire in a pitch black room. And it seems the scientists are saying for such a thing to occur in humans would require multiple mutations 
to happen at once. So what is the evidence of that? Dr. William Brown, this is how he describes what he believes is changing. I believe that genetic modification is occurring right now in utero and is actually producing a new human. This is shown by exponential increase in autistic, certain types of autistic, ADD, indigo children. The new genetic architecture allows them to see the world in a multidimensional fashion. I believe research would show dormant genetic regions are being integrated into the biological system, and this is occurring in all of us to produce expanded awareness. Their brains are working faster, they have access to, inf to more information, and in the classroom, learning is much faster than normal. I believe they already know what is being taught. The intrinsic understanding of certain knowledge and information goes down to biomolecular level, where the sentient activity of the brain actually takes place in the atomic structure of the DNA molecules. It's transgenerational information. This information is encoded within the atomic structure of the DNA and can be accessed with greater efficiency to produce savant-like characteristics. The modification of the DNA is more the remodeling of the genome to make dormant regions accessible again. The hybrids are altogether a new species of human, and I could go into that as well, but we, we haven't got time at the moment. Let's go into these letter people as this particular scientist from Northern Europe. I can't give you her name because if uh, in her country this was known that she had experiences and was um, talking about this, she, it would cause her problems. All you need to know is that she's got a PhD in molecular toxology. She's also got a bachelor in biochemistry and molecular biology diploma. She's a biomedical technician. She's had many UFO encounters, near-death experiences. She's a psychic, etc., etc. These programs such as ADD, ADHD, Asperger's, she calls letter people. I do not believe these are broken genes, but instead offering a new multidimensional skills and to prevent limited reprogramming of a third dimensional reality. It's not so simple as foreign DNA. It's a combination of genetically improved bodies in combination with souls from different places in our universe, incarnating in these improved bodies. The souls have different frequencies, vibrations, depending on their evolutionary status that plays a role in activation of the DNA in that particular body. I believe you also have to take into account the collective soul of Homo sapiens. Letter people show an impairment in communication between brain halves, thus use one side of the brain for solving the same problem. They say we are dysfunctional, however it may be a way to free more space in the brain for solving difficult tasks. The Asperger part might be responsible for higher knowledge and not interested in traditional learning. Isn't that an interesting understanding? Letter people have different bodies and nervous systems. We have upgraded nervous systems. In my case, I have more nerve ends for pressure in my skin. I can see more colors and differences between shades of color. Acute sense of smell and taste and acute hearing, a bit outside normal range. Sensitive to frequencies of all kinds, which means radioactive radiation, energy fields, and energy beaming out from angry people or animals, as well as love and happiness in them. If we can learn how to focus and control our own energy fields, we would be less prone to get ill from our surroundings. We can use our own self-healing abilities. I'm sure many of you can relate to that one way or another. I will make this really quick because I've got so much to cover, but basically she understands ways of dealing with ADHD as a letter person. If you want more information, come to me afterwards. The differences she's discovered that there are, she's observed calculated letters Levels of acetylcholine and dopamine in the brain are higher in letter people. So she's saying that they need more choline from the vitamin B family because they use more of it. So that's the simplicity behind the cure for letter people. I can go into more detail about that later if I have time. So in other words, there are very simple ways that if you believe you or any of your family have this, um, these challenges, that there are some very simple ways to deal with it but come back to me if, if you find that interesting to you. What was fascinating to me when I was actually in Hong Kong, I met a, a lovely researcher called Neil Gold, and what was the clue there? When I met him, he said, Mary, I didn't know I was ADHD. I, he's in his 50s. He said, but I always knew, I only found out, he said, I was ADHD down the track. He said, as a child, though, I always saw reality differently. And that was the clue. For me, it's okay. So as an ADHD you're seeing reality differently. What does that mean? 
And of course, since then, he's wrote Close Encounters of the ADHD kind, which is absolutely fascinating. But all these are clues. You know what I'm talking about. You're forever trying to understand what you're hearing and, and put it into a context or a framework. And this is how my process worked. But let's take it one step further. So we know that it's quite possible that many of these so-called dysfunctions may very well be new programs. And the reason that they struggle with conventional schooling is because actually they're not meant to be programmed into a dysfunctional and limited third dimensional reality. And what a great way to do it. Make sure it's hard for them to actually focus and learn in schools. Oh, but let's slow them down and then we've got them back in the box again. Make your own assumptions around that or work through that one. Past life connections to extraterrestrials is very common with my work. Over, I've worked with over 2,000 individuals now um, from all over the globe, and many of them are not even English speaking, so it resonates on some level. This material resonates right across the globe. Tracy says it like this, my contact with non-human cosmic beings has occurred since before I was born. These beings were my family before I came to the Earth domain, and a close relationship with them was continued after my birth. This is the story I'm hearing more times than you would know. And it's from all ages, all belief systems, all cultures, which is fascinating that it resonates. So are we victims or co-participants in our own evolution? ET screen, screen recall, transcending fear. Basically, Tracy says, I misunderstood the greys. The knowing ET part of me initially made a decision to assist them, and the understanding of this can be overshadowed by fear, which stems from our limited human perceptions and reactions to these experiences. Really interesting, isn't it? This transcending of human fear. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Part of our way of becoming um, more open to our multidimensional reality. Many non-human forms. The felines or cat beings, very common. Many, many people see them or interact with them or feel connected to them. And as you know, Simon Parks, who spoke this morning, he also has a very important connection to them. Um, James Gilliland will also say the same to you. In fact, if you look at James, you can see the lion being in his face. It's almost um, co uh, comical. But we have to be careful now about we how we interpret what they're about and what have you, because even with the greys, I was told by one lady that she understood there were at least 165 species of grey. So it's like taking one human being off this planet and saying they represent the rest of us. It's a nonsense. So we've got to be careful about that. And what I say to people is, trust your own experience as the one that you need to go by, because everyone will perceive them and interact with them differently, depending on where they're at in their lives or what they understand. Many different species of star visitors. There are two drawn, one drawn by a Navy man to the left. The right is one drawn by a, a young man who said it's a Syrian being or um, that it's star being that he sees. Or um, another gray type being, this particular one, um, the artist that drew this said he's, he's one that he feels very comfortable with, almost like he'd like a cup of tea. And this one here is a fascinating one. Um, was drawn with a gentleman who's in his 60s now, but when I did a regression with him, he went straight back to being seven and got really annoyed with this being because it was take, he was taking his sandals off. And when you've got a 60-year-old man talking in a little seven-year-old um, voice, it really is, it was very hard for me to keep a straight face. But he realized that these were the being that he was interacting with. Some more, the humanoids, uh, humanoids Nordics, Blue beings, zeta type, many different types of blue beings. And some people who are very spiritual will say, my guide is a tall blue being or whatever. Again, we've got to get away from the stereotypes you know, that we have of judging and start to be open to the fact that it's all in the same basket. It's not separate. And that's really important as far as I understand it. Star being drawn by Martin Law in, in um, Ireland. What I love about Martin's work is he said he needed to give the colors to the frequency of the star beings. But also, you'll see a lot of interesting script, which again is part of the phenomena that I believe very much evidence of a reality of contact, because some of it is quite fascinating and very detailed and very beautiful, although some of it looks like shorthand. And I am getting people from all over the world, small children as well as adults, that have done different types of scripts. And this is fascinating to me, is what is it about, what does it mean? 
These are beautiful drawings by a young lady in Melbourne. Um, she's in her middle 20s now. And she communicates with many different ambassadors, as she calls them. And her awareness of them and her understanding of them is they're like family. Um, she's, you're going to hear her say a few words shortly. And you'll see for yourself what a delightful young lady this is and her awareness of where we're going. So the children having contact. What we're seeing is that they have superior mental and analytical capabilities. They have direct connection to higher awareness. They have extreme sensitivity to thought and emotion. They have enhanced DNA. They, many of them have photographic memories, fast motor neuron responses, and they can manipulate time and space. And they also, many of them, are telepathic. But let's look at how the children talk about this. Some of you may see these images before. This, is, this, this drawing here was done by a 13-year-old. And what's interesting, she's got the egg-shaped gray, but she's also the flat-headed ones as well that she interacts with. Um, so they recognize there are many different forms of beings. This one is drawn with an energy field that she called clowny, the screen memory where children are frightened of clowns often because they're aware that maybe it isn't a clown after all. And this is the craft, she's, um, the small craft, she says, takes her to the bigger craft, which she even remembers which window she used to look out of. Really interesting detail when children talk of these. But many of them feel they have a dual consciousness um, part human, part extraterrestrial. And I'm going to talk about a little eight-year-old boy that um, lives in Queensland. And this is what he said. Um, I'm on the spacecraft with some of my school friends, and sometimes I see these beings, uh, see the, the, the um, children as human, and sometimes they're alien selves. It's like the other part of them shows themselves. And I've had other stories where somebody's met someone in the street, and one minute they're looking human, and the next minute they see this strange alien aspect to them. And I think this is just showing the genetics. But let's talk about, let, I'm going to let you hear a young man, this young man, talk about his mantid family. I draw what I'm seeing, he's saying, when he goes through all these many drawings. His mother saw him drawing many of these, uh, these complex drawings that were very precious to him from three years old. And eventually she discovered that he was having what she had had, um, you know, many years before similar experiences. And he says that he can communicate with animals, he sees energy fields. And you're going to hear him talk to me a little bit about his experience. Since I've been little, I've been drawing what I've been seeing. So that's what's... So these drawings are what you're actually been seeing? Yes. Okay. And sometimes... The things that just pop into my head. Okay. So, um, um, where do you, um, where did you see these things, these images? Sometimes on planets. Um, sometimes on, on the um, ships. Sometimes when people, when I've been down here, and people have just been walking around, but they haven't seen them, but I've seen them. They've been. I'm um, talking to me through my head when they're not there. When you say that they're not there, you, you're saying that you can't sense them around you, but you yeah. can get information coming into your head. Yes. And what kinds of things would they talk to you about? When about they my purpose, about what I should do, about if... Um, things around me are good or bad, sometimes if the day is going to be good or bad. When you say your purpose, what do they tell you about your purpose? Because you have said to me before that you really, you, you know, you have a way of understanding what animals feel and, and you, you get a sense of that. Could you, could you say a little bit about your purpose and that as well? Well, I, th I think my purpose is to help animals to um, make sure that people don't mistreat animals. Basically, I'm just nature. Okay. And so, what do they, uh, is that what they tell you that your purpose is? Basically, it, yes. Okay. So, you know that's something that you've come here to do. Is that right? Yes. The rest is a little bit more complex than I can't really say. So, there are some things that you can't really tell us about. Because they're too complex. Because they're too complex. That's fine. Uh, um, and in terms of you knowing about these different um, shapes and forms of beings, what particular beings do you mostly know that you interact with or you connect with? 
the mantis, the um, lion, and this one. And what is that one there? This one here. Can you tell, tell us? This one um, This one here. Who's this? It's my um, uncle. He is a. My uncle. He's um. Uh, angel. Okay. So when you say your uncle, um, you are aware that your uncle is an angel. Yes. Can you? And this is the the face. Is it of? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So the angel that you are aware of is you, is your uncle. Can they look like you or me? No. Um, if there was another form that you've you've seen, could you describe it? Is it a, does it look like anything that we know as as one of the creatures on the planet at all in any way? Do they look like that? No, but they look like they do have the wings, kind of like the wings that I drew when I ah. Oh. Those wings that you, yeah. you drew, which were the ones like, the ones you see in pictures of angels? When did you first see the beings that you feel you've got connections to, which was um, the manta and what was it, the lion, the lion being? When did, when did you first start to see those or, or um, be aware of those? Around three, four. Okay. And were they, did you see them when you were awake in your, you know, in, in, in the house or did, was it a sense that you were seeing them when you were in a dream, a, a kind of dream state? Sometimes during the state, sometimes when I'm like around the house. So you just see them somewhere, um, but no, somewhere just as you're seeing me right now? Yes. It would be like that. And what was your feeling when you saw them? Because um, were you aware that... I thought everyone saw them. So you thought everybody else was seeing them? Isn't it interesting? Some of it he couldn't tell me because it was too complex, which is really good when you were being told that at eight. Um, but also how he described, he thought everybody saw them. And I'm sure some of you in, in this room really relate to that. Now you've all um, heard Simon, and I'm sure, like me, you, you, know, you find Simon has a wonderful way of explaining something really quite challenging to many of us in a way that makes absolute sense. And I connected with, interestingly, Simon at the same time I was working with this young boy who said to me that his family were the Mantid. And what was fascinating, neither of them communicated, it was only me as the conduit between the two. I would ask Simon something or I would ask this young boy I call Paul and I would then say to the other one, can you tell me about X, Y, and Z? And I would find the corroboration. So one of the fa fascinating things was when they both heard the trilling or chirping sound that the little boy actually made to demonstrate the sound from the mantid, um, they held him above their head when they were happy with them. Simon actually said the identical thing. Now this is another, and this is going to take it to another level for some of you. On the craft, um, Simon has, has said to me that his consciousness was moved into the mantid form and he would help with humans on board. The human container will be inhabited temporarily by an ET form, such as a mantid or a grave for a short periods of time, sometimes transfer into my mantid body for a time and their soul would be transferred into mine. What did the eight-year-old little boy Paul tell me? Sometimes on the craft, I evaporate into my mantid body it looks like steam. The mantid makes chirping, trilling sounds. Um, and also another connection where you've got Paul um, Simon saying, I have mantid, lion, and reptilian connections, but the mantid are my real family. My real family are the mantid, says Paul, an eight-year-old. There's many other correlations. I just want to give you a taste of how two people, completely different generations, are saying so many simple, very unique differences that no one could have possibly known and yet are identical. So, I think I levitated last night, he said to his parents. I was in a bubble when I traveled. My ancestors say I go back to my planet when I die. The great ancestor is a manta. My brother manta is someone I see on the spaceship. I see him as human and other times as manta. Ancient Egyptians are not, were not human, but they were cat or lion beings that built the Sphinx. It was to tell humans there are life 
other life forms. Really fascinating. Connections to, or, um, to Egypt, um, there are many, many people that have connected to Egypt. This particularly I wanted to show you because, again, it was something that Tracy Taylor drew when I first met her in, in the middle 90s, and she had many of them that joined together. But when she went to Luxor and Karnak, she knew she had to take this one with her, and as you can see, it fitted identically over one of the hieroglyphs. That, for her, was very profound, because what happens is that those that have experiences, as you well know, they're constantly trying to support what they feel they know from that other level. And it's very confronting, because where do you go and how do you get that corroboration? You know, I'm in a position where I get to hear it all, but they don't. But let's look at what Lee says about her when she travels in astral form. One of the things that's been particularly interesting to me yes. in terms of the soul, oh, right. and there's been um, some of the children and some of the adults mm -hmm. that are very aware that when they go up on the craft, sometimes they'll inhabit a non-human form mm -hmm. while they're on the craft. Okay. That one little boy mentioned he evaporated into the mantis form, yes. for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is this something you've experienced to go into yes. another container for a while? Yes. My astral body is not human, it's a uh, an Ozoni. Mm -hmm. um, it's something to do with a, a, a fav it's a kind of like a life favoritism in, in a way, like your soul remembers this and it wants to duplicate it and just wants to keep it there. It, it's, it's something that I've chosen as well, but something that like this is right, this is what's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And every time I travel, I'm always in my Ozoni, like I look Ozoni, I'm, I'm you know, purplish skin, you know. Have you got the picture of the Yes, Ozoni? I do. I'll show you also a coloured image as well. Find it. An example of, of the, how they look like. Ah, yes. Really interesting, and uh, there's a lot more that I, I, I'll see if I can play this next bit, because I would really like you to hear more of what she's talking about because it will give you a real sense of the kinds of stories and accounts that I hear that really are quite incredibly amazing and very convincing. Uh, I'm Leah Capitelli. I'm 19 years old and I live in Victoria, Australia. Uh, well, I was about uh, five, six years old when I started to get my uh, memories from my past life. They came quite slowly, but they were, I could feel them like, you know, I could get um, certain feelings, certain memories, and I remember telling mom about it. You know, I would, you know, but the thing is, um, long before that, I used to see um, ETs and uh, amongst other things as well, like energy, you know, auras here, here and there. By the time I was seven, eight years old, I, I had a really clear understanding of of what, what is going on and how and how many um, <coughs> how, how, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just trying to. Um, how many things are actually going on right now? And I it was it made me really confused because like how many people don't know as well. So I think and around about eight years old, I realized yeah, there's something going on. That, that you were different in yes. some way because you did mention to me that you're aware of of healing in your hands. What right. age were you when you noticed that? I was about yeah, I'd say about eight years old. I was about okay. Eight, yeah. um, my yeah, and when you see energy fields, do, mm -hmm. do energy fields, when you see them, how do they appear to you? How do you, how do you perceive them? They sometimes go in colors, uh, lights as well. Like, it, it's not like the, the harmful effects of, like, brightness of light, you know how too much brightness mm -hmm. hurts the eyes. It's more like it can be really bright, but it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's usually, like... It, it's it's just all these different sort of things. Like, and it can be in shapes, you know, or formless, or mm -hmm. and it can be, you know, entities themselves. And you could it, it could easily for me. I could easily um was going to uh, university at that time, and um, she would get headaches. I, I remember getting headaches, and you know, sometimes she would be sore in certain places, and I would just put my hands on her in that place, and it would go away. Mm -hmm. And she like after a few seconds or maybe a couple minutes, she would just say like, oh, it's gone now and I'm like well to me it came perfectly not normal like it was totally natural for me and um you know I could I could do it but then around that time I could realize there was something you know go going on uh, with me that other people 
couldn't do. I, I knew my mum couldn't do the same things that I could. And okay. I was like, okay, there's something. which is just an object comparing to an entity. And I just, you know, I slowly from that, like slowly I started to um, understand and learn what is what mm -hmm. very, very early on. And I remember around that same time I was getting my connection with the ETs as well. Mm. And they would teach me like, this is um, what this means. Like this is when you see this energy, this is a vortex or this is like, you see this um, round, round entity, it's just a soul or you see this sort of shape, okay. it's just another entity. They would tell me all So they things. would teach you yes. what you were perceiving? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And which ones were those that helped you understand what you were seeing from that level? Um, it would be the energy beings that were teaching me most of all, because I already had a um, prior uh, connection with, with one of them, because I was close with one of them in a, in a previous life, and I was exactly, and only once I actually ever saw an energy being outside the suit. It was, because um, like after that time, I, I learned what to see, when I see energy, I could see, um, I could understand what, what was happening, and when he mm -hmm. revealed himself to me, I could see like light around him and I could see a very very faint shape of how he would have looked like if he still had a solid body mm. and um, I could just like because of my knowledge my learning I could yeah I know that I know what I'm looking at and I wasn't scared at all there was no no fear if anything I was more comfortable with that than anything I've experienced on it like I can tell you that right now mm. so, yeah. so that was actually more comfortable and natural to you yes. than being um, a human Oh yeah, by far. See, they, how did you perceive that? Well, um, when I was fairly young, they showed me in a in a human or like a human appearance. Yes. But then, as soon as I uh, when I would gradually get old, a bit more mature, it uh, they started to show how they really looked like. But mm -hmm. the thing is, they were in their sort of they were still not showing their true energy form. They were still sort mm -hmm. of like contained in a way. So they were careful about what they showed you to begin. Very interesting, isn't it? How she has been quite aware of her interactions almost from the word go and that anything she didn't understand in her, uh, her multi-dimensional um, uh, experiences were explained to her by her non-physical um, sources, if you like. And this is what I'm hearing all the time. And I'm, I'm hopefully going to have a bit of time to tell you about what I call the, 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 the school, the ET school that li little Paul also talks about where he learns things to use his brain waves, as he says, with other children from school, but also other children, he said, that were not looked human but had bigger eyes, so they were not human. But I'm very aware of the time, so I'm going to have to really whiz through. I'm only going to briefly say this. This particular picture I have, two people, one, Paul, who's eight, an adult experiencer, both called it a gate, a gate into other universes, which is really interesting that I got this reaction about this particular picture. Again, it's one corroborating another. They haven't met, they've never spoken. Another interesting fact was um, young children, one four-year-old, one 15-year-old boy told me that they were um, aware that when the beings touched them, their skin felt like dolphin skin. Now, how they know about dolphin skin is really an interesting question in itself. But again, looking for corroboration, I found a very interesting comment in this book by Dr. Michael Wolf. Some of you will know that he worked in um, Area 51, Dulce S4. He wrote this book, The Catchers of Heaven, about his, his um, interactions with different kinds of beings. Um, one of them was Coulter, who is on the cover there, and he um, reveals a great deal in the book. But interesting, these are his comments about the greys. The greys have personalities and a sense of humour. Their smooth, soft skin felt like dolphin skin to touch. They share the same evolutionary path as dolphins. And I have not met a grey I didn't like, which is really interesting. ET communication, telepathic downloads, complex geometric art, crop circles, scripts, star languages, what does it all mean? One of the things that Tracy says is it should be borne in mind that the nature of extraterrestrial communications, in a majority of instances, SAR visitors communicate with humans by telepathic transfer of mental images and concepts rather than by words and speech. Everything is made up of the same matter, resonating at different harmonics. So the ETs are able to communicate with us, directing thought on subatomic levels, and so activate the subconscious. 
These symbols are meant to communicate the nature of the macrocosm, which is really fascinating. So let's look at why so many are drawing these different symbols and marks. These particular scripts are interesting. One of them, a lady sent me this, this markings、um, that her five-year-old wrote on her arm and said, "It's to help you understand, Mum." And really, really interesting. Why would she do this on her arm? Interestingly, in my own、uh, where I live, a gentleman told me that his son and a friend. At four years old, started to write symbol, sorry, symbols on their arm. Really, really interesting. Why would they do that? This is from a script of a、uh, gentleman who's now no longer three, but as you can see, it's quite a complex script to be writing at three years old. And this is what he told me about his earlier years. Three times a week, I'd be woken by a glow, a woman、um, many, with long hair, green eyes. And there was no beam me up, Scotty. We would be in a room. Walls were metallic when touched, would ripple like water. A window like a plasma screen would show stars, nebula, and symbols. When put in correct order, would show me things. Very, very interesting. Here is some more of those symbols that he put on his arm. And when I asked him why, he said I wanted other people like myself to recognise me, so we could connect. Many feel very isolated and very alone. And understandably, I'm very reluctant to share this with anybody else. And as you can see, there are some highlighted there. He said, when certain things happen on the planet, certain parts, certain of those symbols seem to irritate him, almost highlighting that they represent something. I'm not going to let you hear the young lady、um, say this because it's not time. But I've got a seven-year-old young girl who had、uh, her mother had my book, and in it is a script by Tracy Taylor. The mother. Was reading it. The little girl saw the script, and she said, "I can read that." And her mother said, "Can you?" Okay. She read it in the language and then translated it. When I found out about this, I asked her to do it over Skype, and this little bright seven-year-old said, "Oh yes, I can." I said, "Can you do it in, you know, in the language as well as as English?" She said, "I can do both." She spoke in the language. She translated it into English, and I said to her, "So what's the source of that information?" She said, "Oh, that one's the Greys." Seven years old. I have other evidence of similar things, but that's just one. So the script seems to be part of the learning that may very well be on the craft. This is an 11-year-old and his script. I've got many, many pages of script. Here's another beautiful one here from Martin Laura in Ireland, and he said that he knows whenever he doesn't do it correctly, but he hasn't got a clue what it means. I'm rather astonished. Of what I've done, the characters are consistent, flawless, but to my sense, is written in the bold confidence and authenticity of a piece of Zen callig calligraphy. To be honest, I haven't a clue what I've written, but I do know when I write only one character wrong, I throw it on the fire and start again. Fascinating. Many different kinds of script, not doodles. Believe me, these are not doodles. Okay, so the artwork, and I'm going to cover this quickly. This wonderful artist. Has downloaded over the period of a, I think it was 10 years, a whole working process of what she said was information: biology, neurology, physics, astronomy, astrophysics, theology, philosophy, spirituality, technology, anthropology, and archaeology. I felt by downloading these images, they were coming from higher intelligences and teaching me, and awakened me to a higher consciousness. I learned to see life differently. The art progressed in groups at a time, telling me something I was not aware until the next body of artwork was completed. It took me ten years before I realised specific information was being relayed to me through this art-making process. And these are some of the images.、Um, these are some of the beings that she is communicating with. Very interesting, fascinating images. But I came across people that actually could understand on some level what this was all about. This particular lady is a wonderful artist in Western Australia,、um, and Lorraine has, has had many interactions. You can see here there's Uluru, and a, a quite an interesting anomalous light there where she had some interactions. But when I showed her pictures, because she was an artist, somehow or other she seemed to shift into a new gear when she saw them. And so when I showed things like this to her, this is what she was saying. There are two eyes looking at me. This is affecting my body. There's another download. We are mirror images of they, the matrix. We don't need to understand. It's interstellar. It's galactic. When people look at this, they will be open to possibilities. 
Some now being born have a direct link to that bright light, a, thre a, a thread to all the new ones, which came through simply by her looking at those images. Here's another one. It's amazing. I'm going somewhere. It's a portal, an entrance. It's like I'm not here, but can be between both places at the same time, like the ability to go there and be with them. Leonardo da Vinci created the same portal. They're working through me, through the pictures, the matrix. It's downloading to people's subconscious. They're full of compassion. It's just like us, we are they. What fascinating way of tuning in to these pictures. Terry Mace is a psychotherapist in the UK who I was showing some of these images to a few years ago at another conference. He was completely traumatized when he looked at them. In fact, he felt like he was downloading them instantly. When I saw Tracy's art to begin with, I was traumatized. I felt sick and felt almost like I had a nervous breakdown. It knocked me off my feet, metaphysically, spiritually, an internal implosion like a light going on. Switches pulled, flashbacks, experiences I sensed and understood, something I shouldn't have had knowledge of as awakening spiritually. Since being a child, I had forgotten and something I'd been trained to do. I was able to sense and switch on a channel and use my hand as a barcode reader, scanning with the third eye to receive the equivalent of several hundred terabytes and uploaded them, an uplink that knocked me backward, backwards. I felt like I'd been hit by a lightning strike, information and data at light speed and continues, I understood on multiple levels what it meant, what its potential was for humanity. Group consciousness, interpreting codes, ciphers, signs, forms, geometric formula, blueprints, designs, models, encryptions, meta-languages, hieroglyphics, schematics, an internal Rosetta Stone was turned on, an intergalactic process I could understand on a conscious and superconscious level, something I had been trained to do. I was a code breaker, able to in interpret encrypted codes received and downloaded. I don't know where it comes from, but was activated by the artwork. I'm able to un understand and do something with it. Now it's five to five. I'm going to stop to give you 10 minutes and I'm going to take you further down the rabbit hole. So hang on to that thought. Gary. We'll have a break for 10 minutes. Uh, the staff is still waiting.